happy colloquium. Um, so we, we call this a human rights happy hour, so you all should feel free to get up and get food when you need to. No one can leave till all the food's gone. Um, so, and we intentionally give a little bit of time for folks to visit, so glad you all were taking advantage of that. Um, the colloquium um, this semester that you've come to see part of is, um, some of you know, called Global Inequality and Human Rights. And uh, just so you know, it's a part of a class that Edward Shore, um, who is here in the coat and tie, and I teach together. Um, and there are students planted throughout the room, but um, primarily there and there who take the seminar. Um, and we have the opportunity to read the work of guest speakers before they come, um, and uh, along with other reading, often by the same speakers. So we did that last week, and um, so the students have been uh, quite um, enmeshed in the work of, uh, engrossed in the work of Keisha Khan Perry, which has been really fun, and it's a real delight to have her here today. Um, I'll just say another word about the, the, the seminar and then the colloquium that runs side by side. Um, we're focusing on three different um, frameworks to kind of think what we say beyond inequality, and those are racial capitalism, world systems theory, and distributional analysis. And one of the things that's great about Keisha Khan Perry's work that she's gonna present for us today um, is at least, she might disagree, but we think it fits into a racial capitalist frame as well as a world systems frame, and I think will help us um, think about both of those um, collectively and individually. Um, so the title of uh, her talk today is Occupy Citizenship, the Black Struggle Against Land Loss in the Americas. Um, and there's sort of an alternative title to the paper that she's gonna present, which I think is worth reading, um, which is, the, the paper's definitely worth reading, but the title is also worth reading out loud, um, which is called The Gendered Racial Logic of Black Dispossession, A Transnational Feminist Perspective. Um, so if you put that all together, we could rearrange the different sides of the colon, um, and uh, you, it covers a lot. Um, so I'll introduce uh, Dr. Keisha Khan Perry, who is Associate Professor of Africana Studies at Brown University. Um, it's really wonderful to have her back here. Uh, she is, did her PhD um, at the University of Texas um, in anthropology, uh, graduated in 2005 um, in some of the early days of the Rappaport Center, and um, we intersected way back then. Um, so uh, it's, this is, it, she comes back fairly often, so um, we're really delighted about that and especially delighted that she has done that today. Um, Dr. Perry is a feminist anthropologist and political activist whose research focuses on urban black social movements and their struggle against the violence of forced displacement in the Americas. Um, her award-winning book, and I have a show and tell, uh, Black Women Against the Land Grab, The Fight for Racial Justice in Brazil, um, was published in 2013. Um, and it examines the participation and leadership of black women activists in the Gamboa de Baixa region, uh, neighborhood of Salvador Bahia, and how their interpretation of racial and, inter and gender identities intersect with urban spaces. Um, and I just, I was showing it to her, this is a very well-worn copy of the book from the library. Um, various people have underlined all kinds of things in it. Somebody spilled coffee on it. I think we need to get the library to get a few five more copies or something because uh, I know you're all gonna run um, out to, well, no, just buy it. You don't need to check it out um, from the library. Um, and I wanna say, for me, it's particularly um, special to meet uh, Keisha Khan in person because in 2008, um, she connected us to the activists in Gamboa de Bajo and I took a group of students there and we were actually, I found some of the photos from it. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, it was really important to the, the project we were doing on Afro-descendant land rights in the Americas. Um, so she's writing a new book uh, entitled Anthropology for Liberation, Research, Writing, and Teaching for Social Justice, um, while also working on a bunch of new projects, one of which you'll hear about today. Um, and I really appreciate her sharing a draft with us. It's hard to get people to do it, and um, it's really terrific, and it means that um, like the students have really enjoyed um, being able to sort of participate in it and think through it. Um, after uh, Keisha Khan speaks, we'll hear from Pavitra Vasudevan, Vasudeva I knew I was gonna do that wrong, Vasudevan, 
um, who is a relatively new professor um, in African and African Diaspora Studies and Women's and Gender Studies at UT. Um, her PhD is in geography, and she's a critical and feminist geographer. And one of the things we like to do with respondents is get people from a different discipline and or region. We kind of did both of those things here, but probably more region than discipline because she's kind of an ethnographist, geographer, and I would say people kind of sort of a geographical ethnographer. Or I didn't do that right. Anyway, um, there's, I think you'll see that there's a fair amount of intersection. Um, and the book that uh, Pavitra is working on is called Exposing Aluminum, Death and Desire in Racial Capitalism, which centers black feminist and decolonial theory in the lived experiences of workers and their communities who constitute global production. So those were long introductions, but I wanted you to get a little bit more than what you got even on the, um, from the email or the website, um, because they're both terrific people, and I wanted to, I, I think you'll see sort of how their work overlaps and um, get you excited to get engaged with them. So with that, Teacher Khan, thank you again. Um, first, I would like to um, say it's wonderful to be in Texas. Um, it's actually warmer than I anticipated. I don't know why, but um, it's lovely. I would like to thank um, professors um, Karen Engel and Eddie Shore for the invitation to speak um, here with you today um, and the opportunity for me to share my work, of course, and for the students um, who took the time to read the work, um, as well as Sarah um, Ilieson, who ha had tremendous patience over the last couple of months organizing this talk. Um, as I was falling behind in my email every single day. Um, so this represents a wonderful opportunity for me to kind of get um, this part of my second project out the door, um, and it's wonderful. I know that colleagues like Kristen Smith are gonna, it's like, I feel like I've, you've heard some of these um, uh, ruminations before about this project, so it's wonderful um, to have you here, um, as well as, um, he's not here, Ted Gordon, but um, he's my former advisor and I, want to thank him publicly um, for shaping me um, to be the scholar I am um, today. And of course, to Professor uh, Pavitra uh, Vasudavan, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, in advance for your comments, and I'm really delighted to hear you read, um, to hear what you have to say, as again, I try to revise and send it out for publication. So in today's presentation, I provide a reflection on some of the research findings for my next book project. And I should mention that the Anthropology for Liberation book um, really draws from the first book, um, um, Black Women Against the Land Grab, but certainly looking at some of the dangers that black women anthropologists face when doing field work in violent fields and what it means to truly do engage in activist refer, um, research that oftentimes require that we um, do work in violent fields. So I provide a reflection of some of the research findings for my next book, tentatively entitled the Historical Paradox of Citizenship, Black Land Ownership and Loss in the Americas. Um, today, I will draw upon three moments in Brazil, Jamaica and the United States to illustrate why land still matters today. I'm also working on another project that comes out of that book um, entitled Evictions and Convictions, The Gendered Racial Logic of Black Dispossession um, that looks at intersections of gentrification, policing, and mass incarceration. As a feminist scholar of the black diaspora, I take seriously Patricia Hill Collins' theoretical and methodological call that we return to the urgent material issues such as land, housing, and public education that concern black women and that inform black feminist thought in the first place. Black women, I argue always, are key pro political protagonists mobilizing at the grassroots against forced removals and for police abolition and articulating a critique of gendered racial capitalism. So thank you so much for also recognizing my book as being part of that conversation. So some of you may be, uh, um, be familiar with moment number one, and I'll explain where I'm going with that in the second project, but I'll remind some of you. On Saturday, May 3rd, 2003, the front cover of the Brazilian newspaper Atarji showed a photo of 53-year-old Milton, uh, Milton dos Santos sitting on top of a yellow bulldozer. His left hand covered his face, which was hidden by a blue Firestone baseball cap that matched his uniform, and Senor Hamilton was crying. The headline read, 
un homme, a one man, and the accompanying caption described the dramatic scene as follows. The screams of revolt and pain were stronger than the 20 policemen armed even with rifles. The day before in Palestine, a predominantly black, um, poor black neighborhood located on the periphery of Brazil's northeastern city of Salvador in the state of Bahia, six police cars with more than 20 fully armed military policemen, some with machine guns and rifles, stepped, stopped in front of two ad adjoining homes of, Don, uh, of Thelma Sueli dos Santos Sena and Ana Celia Gomez Conceição. Accompanying a bulldozer and a moving truck, the military police had, had arrived in Palestina to carry out orders to remove the residents and their belongings from their homes, demolish the houses, and clear the land where Donna Thelma lived with her husband, seven children, two grandchildren, and a daughter-in-law. The two families were home when the police and demolition squad arrived, and their neighbors immediately reacted with alarm. I just read from chapter one of my first book, Black Women Against the Land Grab, The Fight for Racial Justice in Brazil, where I begin, uh, where I begin with uh, this narration of the agony of Dona Thelma, who stood in front of a bulldozer as it was about to demolish her home in the Palestina, which translates to mean Palestine neighborhood of Salvador on May 2nd, 2003. The conflicted bulldozer driver, even more than being afraid of the fully armed military police, was found profoundly shaken by the pressure of the family and neighbors mobilized to fight the demolition, and he refused to carry out the job. To this day, almost two decades later, many in Gamboa de Baixa, maybe 15 years rather, many in Bahia and throughout Brazil can still remember the story, reciting exactly where they were when the emotional scene in Palestine unfolded on live television and was repeated on local and national news for several days afterward. They watched through the glass windows of electronic stores from the stoops of their neighbors' houses or from living rooms of their employers as they cleaned. Part of, part of my argument in that, in that chapter that echoes throughout the book is that scholars of social movements need to pay more attention to black women's political participation and leadership as Donna Thelma and her struggle for land and housing rights are rarely remembered in the story. I have argued that it is necessary to refocus on the courageous landowner Donna Thelma um, and the numerous other poor black families and peripheral neighborhoods facing similar land disputes. Black women are at the heart of the struggle for urban land rights in Salvador and the citywide housing and, and land rights movement. Yet very little was heard and little is still known about Donna Thelma and her family's land claims. Ethnographic research, especially on grassroots movements such as neighborhood association and neighborhood associations and labor move, um, unions makes black women's political work highly visible. We can observe their everyday organizational work and community building that are necessary to spark and sustain social movements and the personal and political experiences of black women can be read clearly in the historical archives. The story of Donna Thelma should also be considered as one ethnographic backstory for the popular street protests in Brazil in June 2013 that drove more than a million to the streets in major cities such as Recife, from Recife to Rio de Janeiro. Over the past decade, I have focused my research on how, as a result of the forced demolition of urban neighborhoods and displacement of residents, urban spaces are terrains of, con of constant struggle for blacks, women, and poor people in Brazil. Lacking the legal and financial means of countering urban redevelopment, residents of poor black neighborhoods have mounted a significant grassroots resistance against the threat of their loss of, loss of their lands and homes. When all else fails, community organizations led by black women continue to develop strategies for resisting demolition when the bulldozers arrived. arrived. Mass street protests generating political demands for improved and accessible infrastructural resources have been a constant in these cities. Weeks after Donna Thelma stood up to the demolition and military police squads in 2003, what is rarely remembered is that several st cities, th um, th um, including Salvador, came to a halt when thousands of students protested increases in bus fares. A decade before the 2013 protests and almost two decades be before recent protests even around subway fares in Chile, what these kinds of political mobilization teach us is that there exists historical continuity that require analytical attention. Furthermore, while there tends to be a proliferation of the visual representation of recent protests throughout Latin America um, as the discontent and critique are as coming only from white and middle class segments of the population, um, the focus on Brazil, 
Specifically, I caution us to think more critically about how a continued focus on these kinds of social movements erased the activism of blacks, women, and poor people over generations. I suggest that we must begin to examine more closely the polit political spaces in cities where blacks and poor people are engaged in the long durée of struggle for structural equality and citizenship rights. How does reason, read in events like the 2013 protests um, when there is an overwhelming presence of white middle class activists or in 2013 around the impeachment of Gilmar Rousseff, how do we read in them as exceptional moments in Brazilian political history rather than just one dimension of a longer, um, so a broad, of a broader, a longer and broader social movement for the redistribution of basic resources such as transportation, healthcare, and land contribute to the erasure of black mass activism taking place. If it is now likely understood in Brazil that social and economic in, um, inequalities such as bus fares um, that are incommensurate with, with um, low salaries is deeply structured by race and gender, it is the result of, of centuries of the ideological and political work by race, um, by race um, sorry, being done by the marginalized black masses. From the perspective of black activists, the political outrage against structures of social and, um, and economic inequality expressed by a white middle class is usually absent, um, absent when articulated by the black masses. In other words, not only is there little attention given to the political spaces of black mobilization, such as the occupations in Sao Paulo, for example, but also when black activists critique the state by articulating how race and gender shape their class experience or their experiences with capitalism, or, um, there is little political em empathy. This also explains why there, is, why there is little empathy for community activists like Dona Thelma, and the media had little interest in documenting the violent displacement communities face. That included the mobilizations against the mass displacements in preparation for the World Cup and the Olympic and Paralympic Games in 2014 and 2016. In recent news updates, Sonia Milton was asked if he would do the same today, step down from the bulldozer. He replied, it was a day that changed everything for me and I would do the exactly the same again. I have a home, I have a family, and what right do I have to, um, have to come and pass a tractor over another person's house, leaving everyone with no place to sleep, without shelter. I have ne never done this kind of work. I have, I have never been asked to do it again. The bull driver actions Bull drive, uh, bulldozer drivers' actions should be understood within the context of poor and black people's solidarity with an ongoing urban movement, urban movement against land evictions. He was also a poor black worker who lived in one of Salvador's peripheral neighborhoods. It happened to be Donatelma's house and land in Palestina that were targeted, but it could just as well have been his family's house and land under siege elsewhere. What is driving this next phase of my scholarship on the struggle for land and rights, land rights in Brazil is my preoccupation with shifting away from a certain kind of political exceptionalism that undergirds our understanding of present day popular protests. There is history of these conflicts, of blacks owning and losing lands, of small and large mobilizations to regain individual and collective land rights. Some of the earliest documents on black land ownership and conflicts that appear in the 18th and 19th century documents in Bahia reveal how black families such as Donatelmas came to own land in the city in the first place. On the day of the scheduled demolition, Donatelma showed the police officers legal documents certifying that her land had passed from the original owner to her grandmother, whose descendants had always lived and worked on the land since the colonial period. After Donatelma's grandmother died, the land was bequeathed to her children and grandchildren. Before Donatelma built her house on the, land, on the property, the land was undeveloped and other families occupied adjacent plots where they built their houses and raised their children. A dissertation by black economic historian and now city councilman and actually the ca a candidate for the mayor of Salvador, Silvio Passos Acuna, has, has, has revealed that blacks today own significantly less land than they did during the slavery period and that black women, especially leaders of tejeros or Afro-Brazilian condom, um, condomly religious sites of worship have owned and lost significant parcels of land in cities. In his analysis of the Bahia and Heconcavo, or the coastal ter territory of the Bay of All Saints in Bahia, where sugar plantations dominated the slave economy um, at, the end, at the end of the 19th century in the transitional period from slavery to abolition, Cunha shows how the gradual process of emancipation 
over the course of the late 19th century led to a rupture in the social racial order and formation of cities such as Salvador. In some instances, plantation owners gave land to their former um, slaves in, in hopes that they would continue to work on the land and not disrupt in, um, agricultural production. Cunha's economic and historical, historical perspectives lead, lead our analysis beyond Donatelma's personal struggle taking place on the periphery of Salvador to trace her family's ownership claims over the course of the last century. Her story exemplifies the violent land conflicts taking place today in response to the coordinated efforts of unscrupulous land grabbers, developers, the military police, and demolition squads. Donatelma's claim of seemingly bene benevolent transfer of land to black women after years of unpaid service as domestic workers or nannies is not unusual in the historical records which also points to the complexity of social as well as biological ties. For example, these women, these black women, were oftentimes the children of wealthy white landowners, and in many instances were indeed their former slaves who were encouraged to stay on the land to continue the domestic and farm work. This example of Donatelma also in her unearths a historical engagement with by Brazilian blacks with kinship property rights and the law, um, as well as the advancement of a language of ownership and citizenship belonging and a rejection of the perversive use of the pejorative terms of urban um, illegality and squatting. And we can talk a little bit more about what I mean um, by that. Um, so I had to kind of condense this talk from the, the longer paper. So moment number two. I would like to take you back to July 2000. 10. Shirley Sherrod was serving as the state of Georgia's first black director of rural development for the U.S. Department of Agriculture when the Obama administration demanded her resignation. A couple of months earlier, she had given a speech to the Coffee County NAACP in which she told the story of her breakthrough experience with an elderly white farmer. In twisting what Sherrod thought was a powerful message of choosing not to hate to an audience who in their majority had lived through Jim Crow, an edited version of the speech represented her as admitted to practicing racial discrimination in the, federal, in the Federation of Southern Cooperatives Assistance Fund. She was placed on administrative leave and later forced to resign. Her former colleagues at the Federation wrote a statement to the Secretary of Agriculture. We find it ironic that in the 100 years of USDA's history of discrimination, not a single white person has been, has been dismissed for discrimination. However, a black woman who is doing her job uh, well is falsely accused of discrimination in an altered video, and you decide that she can no longer do a credible and non-discriminatory -discrimin job of dispensing USDA rural development programs and must resign. In her recent memoir, The Courage to Hope, How I Stood, hu stood Up to the Politics of Fear, Sherrod describes how the episode of political drama was hardly representative of how she had lived until then. In 2010, she was middle-aged and had been an, a, quote, unglamorous worker bee who liked to keep her head down and do my job, unquote. By the end of July, she was offered an official apology, but she was not offered or her old job back. Shirley Sherrod and her cause for black land rights had become disposable. Sherrod's untimely departure reveals a peculiar history that hardly attracts the same kind of media circus as an accusation of reverse racism and public shaming and dismissal. Many still, acknowledge, many still lack knowledge of her political trajectory, including her direct involvement in exposing racist practices in the distribution of USDA loans to black and women farmers, which led to the massive loss of black owned, um, black owned land and in making black land ownership a crucial civil rights issue in recent decades. The work that she had long been doing in silence and without much public recognition involved the development of community land trusts throughout the United States. When black farmer w, um, John W. Boyd Jr., president and founder of the National Black Farmers Association, drove his, tract his tractor from Virginia to Capitol Hill in September 2010 and throughout the city of Washington each morning, there was little public outrage 
about the historic racial discrimination suit involving black farmers. Boyd had previously ridden his mule in front of federal buildings in Virginia, New York, as a direct, direct reference to the failed promise of 40 acres and a mule for freed African Americans. The Federation of Southern Cooperatives Assistance Funds Fund provides a historical outline of black land loss that is crucial for my mapping of what that loss looks like over space and time. In 1903, W.B. Du Bois launched a serious critique against the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, commonly referred to as the Freedmen's Bureau, United States federal agency established in 1865 during the Reconstruction era to assist freedmen with, their, with employment, education, health care, and other everyday needs, Du Bois wrote. In the work of establishing the Negroes as peasant proprietors, the Bureau was, the first, was, a, was from the first handicapped and at last absolutely checked. Something was, um, something was done and larger things were planned. Abandoned lands were leased so long as they remained in the hands of the Bureau. And the total revenue of nearly half a million dollars derived from um, black tenants. Some other lands to which the nation had gained um, title were sold on easy terms and public lands were open for settlement to the very few freedmen who had tools and capital. But the vision of 40 acres and a mule, the righteous and reasonable ambition to become a landowner, which the nation had all but cat categorically promised to freedmen, was destined in most cases to bitter disappointment. Du Bois understood that the well-intentioned work of the Brewer created a system that returned freedmen to plantation life as laborers with, free, with, with few rights and few prospects for socioeconomic uplift. The government's failure to fulfill its promise of 40 acres and a mule that would guarantee black land ownership represented a signific significant obstacle for avoiding dependency on the federal government. For Du Bois, land ownership signif signified black self-reliance and the Bureau's abandonment of the granting of land rights on the reconstruction as a result of violent white opposition to blacks having any rights at all meant for US history, a missed opportunity for achieving democracy. And we can talk a little bit more about what that means because it's not necessarily just about the ownership of land in within the logics of settler colonialism, but certainly what it meant um, to be able to cultivate and provide for yourself in a post-abolition moment. <coughs> so in describing his recent book, Dispossession, Discrimination Against African American Farmers in the Age of Civil Rights, Pete Daniel writes, quote, black farmers were often unable to obtain credit, information, or other federal benefits, and county USDA offices purposely squeeze black farmers out of farming. Paradoxically, the flight of African Americans from the land coincided um, coincided with the Civil Rights Movement, a time of hope for an end to segregation and discrimination, unquote. According to the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, at the peak of black land ownership in 1910, and the decline being, begins at that time, blacks collectively owned 15 million acres in the United States, and 218,000 um, black farmers were part or full owners of their land, by 1973, they owned only 6 million acres, and by 1992, 2.8 million acres, and there were only 18,000 black farmers. Black were losing their lands to the government and developers, and I should add that by 2007, there was a, sharp, there was a little bit of a sharp increase of black um, farm operators, um, again, to 41,000, and then 44,000 in 2012, but nothing compared to the turn of the century, um, between the 19th and 20th centuries. Shirley Sherrod had been an integral political force in the long civil rights movement as a member of the Student Nonviolent -co non Coordinating Committee and later as the founder of the Southwest Georgia Project and guaranteeing land ownership and fighting against forced land loss in the black struggle for freedom and democracy had always been part of her quiet, unglamorous work. She and her husband, Charles Sherrod, famous for his leadership in SNCC, founded the self-sustaining farm community called the New Communities in um, Lee County, Georgia, borrowing from the Jewish um, kibbutz system, and I would say uncritically borrowing from the Jewish um, kibbutz system. She was also instrumental in forging the relationship between manufacturers and black planters and processors that formed um, the Southern Alternatives Agricultural Cooperative 
and the Southern Rural um, Black Women's Initiative. Many of the women of the Southern Alternatives were also active in the advocacy group called Smithy's Women on the Move that operate after school programs and voter registration programs even um, to this day. Just a, um, focusing on the struggles of black farmers in the United States encourages us to, encourages us to look at an attempt to narrow the rural urban divide to connect housing rights struggles in cities to the historical and spatial genealogy of black land loss nationwide. As the, as, as, as the examples in Brazil and Jamaica also show, black um, demolition of poor neighborhoods, mass displacement as a result of foreclosure and gentrification are also land rights issues that reveal the complexity of property ownership and loss, as well as cultural and spatialized citi um, citizenship in cities. For example, it is impossible to, to separate the violent terrorism that has, plagued, um, that has plagued black farmers or the burning down of all black towns from present day violent state policing and mass incarceration in cities accompanied by black urban removal. Black ac acquisition of land increased under the New Deal then declined over the course of the last century as the necessary government grant programs favored white and wealthier farmers and many black rural residents fled the South to escape rampant racial violence and lynching. How women experience this violence and mass, and, and mass, incarcer and mass incarceration oftentimes becoming heads of household who make decisions on property ownership is key. So for example, um, Shiraz's own father was shot and killed in a dispute with a white neighbor who wanted to steal, uh, who wanted to steal um, his cattle and um, her then pregnant mother took control of the farm as well as fought to avenge his death. Blacks who came to cities to populate cities such as Chicago, New York, and even Las Vegas would succumb to the effects of social and economic abandonment, poor living conditions, and increased criminalization. Critical scholars of race and space, such as Ruth Gilmore, Clyde Woods, and Catherine McKittrick, have argued, and I would um, add um, Kelly Lytle Hernandez's real book, city, um, recent book, um, City of Inmates, have argued that black people have become disposable. And um, I should add that, um, and it's become part of a, a much longer conversation of what people want cities to look like. I argue that cities, um, argue that displacement rather, are being forced to move, exemplifies the link between anti-black racism and disposability, disposability of black spaces and black lives, which includes black rural landowners and urban residents, as well as black women like Shirley Sherrod, who fight against black dispossession. Michelle Alexander's idea of incarceration as a new Jim Crow echoes Cory Walker's description of the current condition of US blacks as redundant, meaning that they represent a surplus in the labor market, they lack a voice in, pub in public politics, um, they are rendered non-citizens, and they must be, must be ex um, excluded spatially as well. So I'm also drawn to Ananya Roy's use of the term banishment, and as I mentioned earlier, Kelly Lytle's formulation of displacement as um, not just banishment, but also as elimination. So a uh, concerted effort to eliminate and disappear um, blacks from um, the built environment, inherent in settler colonialism, as she describes in her book, City of Inmates. As in the era of Jim Crow, anti-black dehumanization and brutality necessitated the enforcement of a logic of state-sanctioned racial segregation of space. In these instances, La, um, land loss for black farmers and increased incarceration of blacks in cities amidst urban redevelopment and gentrification practices expose local struggles of a space and ownership in the making of gendered citizenship. So in the broader project, I examine um, mapping land ownership and loss as well as patterns of black urban displacement and incarceration, making it impossible to divert our attention away from the gendered racial dimensions of spatializing citizenship in this country. For example, it is women who are head in black households, as I mentioned earlier, as well as making the journey between rural, between urban and rural communities, between cities um, and neighborhoods and prisons. The police enough, including banks and landlords, as well as, uh, or banks and landlords as police, um, in addition to um, the state police forces, and incarceration of black and brown women is also increasing at alarming rates. The ACLU has made fighting the overuse of nuisance ordinances or when properties have been labeled as a nuisance when the police has been called a number of times a priority in their advocacy work. 
mostly impacting survivors of domestic abuse, landlords evict their tenants rather than face punishment from the city. And, um, and I should say that domestic, the, the largest number of women who have been evicted um, or going through some sort of eviction case, I've experienced um, some sort of um, domestic violence. So for those, uh, for scholars like Kristen Smith, who have done, who have done a tremendous amount of work to, for us to link the relationship between interpersonal violence and state violence, this becomes really important. So in addition to this, in areas um, where real estate prices are rapidly rising, unscrupulous landlords hire security firms to surveil tenants to find evidence to evict them. These landlords can then renovate and increase rents in previously rent control buildings um, in cities such as New York. The formerly incarcerated were 10 times as likely to be homeless than the general public. This is not disconnected from the fact that the homeless population is much more likely to be arrested for loitering or being a nuisance. And this is part of the logic of banishment than, um, that Ananya Roy talks about. Homeless women also lose their children to foster care. So it's a much more intricate system of violence, right? Yay. Hence, <laughs> hence uh, seeking spatial justice, um, to use Edward Soja's term, is key to understanding the gendered racial struggle against black dispossession and for citizenship over the past century. Specifically, the loss of black land ownership has been necessarily tied to the challenge of individual and collective wealth acquisition manifested in the historical reality that the boys and other US blacks were willing to buy, um, buy land and find liberty in other American contexts um, such as Brazil. And in the, early, um, the longer version of the paper, I talk about why, um, to make that connection to, between the US and Brazil, why African Americans were so preoccupied with going to Brazil. So connecting this pattern um, in the United States to Jamaica emphasizes the relationship between the material manifestations of citizenship and resistance against forced land evictions through methods of, of land occupation. And just briefly, I wanted to also uh, mention um, um, in, in terms of thinking about how mass migration was always part and the, and the, move, the forced movement of African Americans from the South, oftentimes from rural areas to the cities were always a part of this process of yearning and searching for, um, for black citizenship. And these are some of the, um, the maps that I've been working on but need to be updated um, that look at um, just change over time and what these cities look like racially. So it's also it's changing racially but also it's also changing by income. So even with blacks, even new blacks that are coming into neighborhoods like Harlem, um, you can see that their, their income bracket is changed. I'm also interested in, um, and this is, I'm, I'm using the stuff and um, a lot of the data only from the, the previous um, census, but um, to look and see where the concentrations, what are considered kind of concentrations, what are black neighborhoods, oftentimes gentrifying neighborhood um, in, in Manhattan, for example, in the Bronx, how they're also the zip codes where most um, black and brown women are, um, are being policed and incarcerated. And I recently um, started looking at just a small neighborhood of, of Shaw in DC that also is one of the exporting neighborhoods um, of incarcerated population. Okay. Um, for those of you who are interested, Kelly Lytle Hernandez's um, um, digital pro project, Million Dollar Hoods, is really important for thinking about what neighborhoods are producing, um, how much it costs to, to incarcerate people from particular neighborhoods, but also what what the value, the actual dollar value is in incarcerating people from particular neighborhoods. So how real estate prices go up according to, um, as, as people are being pushed out. Okay. I don't think we have time to, to watch the, the video by um, Onisha, but maybe I'll just take it for a second. is the transition to Jamaica. Oh, I guess we won't be watching that. Um, okay. So moment number three, and this is, I'm, so this is, I should, say, I should say that this project also represents the three aspects of my identity. So I would say I was born in Jamaica, I grew up in the United States. I spent much of my adult years in Brazil. So <laughs> you can see how it all 
all comes together. And don't mind me if my accent changes. It's just natural. OK. <coughs> so the third moment is from um, Occupy um, Pinnacle. So Rastafari has been ordered to evict our, bir our birthplace by January 30th, 2014. The Occupy Pinnacle movement, led by Denisha Prendergrass, the late Bob Marley's granddaughter and well-known activist, scholar, Queen Odesh, peaked in, in 2014, but has since lost momentum. The tombstone of Leonard Percival Howell, located on a stretch of mountainous land of more than 500 acres in the parish of St. Catherine, Jamaica, has been demolished. However, I'm sorry, Howell bought the land with the wages he earned as a seaman to establish what would become the village of Pinnacle in 1938, almost 25 years before Jamaica's independence from England, and found in a place for, quote, free thinking men and women to live, learn, and grow within the context of their indigenous African heritage. Pinnacle attracted thousands of black Jamaicans who created a self-sustaining community, providing their own food, schools, arts on the island under colonial rule. It would become the birthplace of Rastafari and agriculture, including marijuana, was the most important source, and marijuana was the most important source of income for the village. They were practicing freedom on their own terms. Their aim was to generate wealth to, connect to, to collectively buy land and repatriate to the African continent. The acquisition of Pinnacle was a philosophical and religious project grounded in Pan-Africanism, but it was profoundly political and economic in practice. On May 23, 1954, the colonial powers burned down Pil Pinnacle, and residents were forced to hide in caves on the property and move to the trenches of the local city. Since then, many material artifacts of Rasta history have been destroyed, including ancient burial grounds, and the lands have been sub subdivided and new homes constructed. In an, a January 20, 2004 news release, as they organized in protest in Kingston, they wrote the fol following. Rastafari is recognized by the United Nations as an indigenous people, which means they have ancestral rights, that we, that we have ancestral rights to our indigenous lands. The Minister of Culture has also recently lobbied for, for Jamaica to have a seat on the UN World Heritage Committee. Yet in our homelands, injustice and corruption runs rampant. The private developers have continued to sell land to unsus unsuspecting local and overseas buyers looking for a peaceful place to reside unknowing of the history that lays below, beneath their feet. Island, Island Homes, which is the name of the real estate company, is still presenting, dynamiting, and damaging our, uh, our um, ancestral evidence and building homes as you read these words. And that's a statement from Occupy Pinnacle. In Jamaica, um, including, um, in, including Jamaica in this analysis of black land loss, represents a crucial aspect of my ethno-historical ex exploration and my theoretical and methodological attempts to link Latin American, Caribbean, and US social and political context in the, ha in the African diaspora. Little research has been done on how widespread land evictions are in rural and urban areas of Jamaica and why the struggles for land rights is led by women and is also deeply intertwined with the struggle for reparations in the country as documented by anthropologists, historians, and political scientists such as Jermaine McAlpin, Hillary Beckles, Vereen Shepherd, and Deborah Thomas. The Occupy Pinnacle movement reveals precisely how gendered racism intertwined with unequal relations of social and economic power operates in predominantly black countries such as um, in black countries in Latin America and the Caribbean such as Jamaica and Brazil. This is one example of the various forms of racism in, in the plural form that permeate American societies and how black women interpret and fight this racism. Rastafari represent not only a religious group in Jamaica, but also a racial group in a society dominated historically by a brown and white majority. Creole, and, and I should say that this is important within the context of what Maziki Kem calls uh, Creole nationalism. And um, she herself has embarked on a project comparing um, uh, Jamaica, Barbados, and Brazil. And if racism against dark-skinned blacks existed throughout the, um, throughout the centuries, Rastafari people are further marginalized for what um, Howell termed their free-thinking beliefs based on an indigenous African heritage and, a specific, and specific ideas about women's biological and cultural reproductive roles. The racism and marginalization they have experienced on the island results from 
a general disdain for blackness and African consciousness, the philosophical foundation of Rastafari, as well as what scholars such as um, um, doctoral student, um, she just graduated, actually, she's no longer a doctoral student, but Dr. <laughs> Wiley, um, Shamara Wiley Alassan, a student who just graduated from Africana Studies at Brown, what she has argued is a misinterpretation of women's social and political power. In fact, the destruction of Pinnacle and its physical and psychic erasure from popular memory, um, including from Rastafari collective historical accounts, cannot be disassociated from the anti-colonial movements and post-independent efforts to modernize and hence Europeanize the population, the Jamaican population, which has racial as well as gendered imp implication. So Pinnacle, as a new way of thinking, a new culture, a new self-sustaining economic practice as Rastafari, as what activists have called a material manifestation of a philosophical tradition and vision of collective black freedom, like Quilombo's uh, Brazil and Palenque's in Colombia, was a threat to Jamaica's sovereignty. Today, and we can talk more about what that means, right? So we're talking about a predominantly black context. Today, the land signifies for the political elite the opportunity for development aimed at modernization and progress. Even as some of the, of the racial hierarchies have been broken down, and dark-skinned blacks, um, blacks and black women, such as poor Sir Simpson Miller, have since become prime minister, a particular kind of anti-black class race, base, um, class race um, racism still permeates on the island. The loss of Pinnacle is just one visible example of anti-black racism against Rastafari that raises key questions about emancipation and the complexities of racial injustice in predominantly black countries. And I'm really looking forward to Deborah Thomas's new book that really explores precisely the violent nature of anti-black racism on the island. And this is one of the, the leaflets from um, the Occupy Pinnacle Movement and also a group of activists, including um, um, Denisha Pendergrass, who had occupied the land um, for a certain period of time. Maziki Tem has argued that those black men and women who occupy these zones of non-being in the Fanonian sense throughout the Americas are dispensable for the state, the elites, and the poor people themselves and justify the violence. But amidst these demolitions and land evictions in Jamaica, Tem has, has asked, why aren't there more uprisings or mass protests around these issues? Political scientist Tony Boggs explains that research needs to focus on a detailed historical reading of the relationship of poor black Jamaicans, specifically women heads of household, house, um, households to political parties. For example, housing demolitions and forced removal also accompany housing reconstruction and the creation of garrison communities such as Tivoli, Tivoli Gardens. That's at the heart of Deborah Thomas's work in, as well. So even in the, um, I think in uh, a recent example is when Barack Obama went to visit um, Jamaica and there was a mobilization against um, his arrival um, and they had to displace a bunch of folks in order to repave the road and so forth. Um, there was a sense that perhaps um, it was political parties that were even organizing the protest, not that it came out of the community themselves. So Rastafari and scholar activist Kirk Scarlett, also known as I Nation, suggests that police and, um, police and military violence pr present during these evictions um, provide a concrete example of how the Jamaican state has become a monster that leads to a dependent black population, that leads a dependent black population to crouch in agony and pain when the violence takes place. Political parties have created individual rather than the collective empowerment necessary to mobilize and fight the state-sanctioned violence of a housing and land loss. Scarlett also alludes to what performance theorists Honor Ford Smith, as well as Kristen Smith, referred to as the normalized repetition of violence, specifically the death of black children and state-sponsored demolitions that creates a politics of fear, as Shirley Shiraz and, and Ida B. Wells also claim in relationship to the United States on, part of black, on the part of black women. Scarlett argues that black, poor black women would rather escape or find escape routes and move their families to the rural areas than fight state-sanctioned state gangsterism that produce ecologies of fear. And the same goes for the burning down and destruction of all black towns in the United States, the Rosewood, Seneca, um, Seneca Village, which is now known as Central Park, for example. And as I cited earlier, Isabel Wilkinson documents um, cases of black fight, flight um, in her book, 
um, and White Terror, the heart of a lot of the black flight taking place in her book, The Warmth of Other Suns, the epic story of the America's Great mig um, Migration. And she equates, um, again, black flight with black citizenship. Echoing Arjuna Pottera and James Holson in their essay, Citizen Citizenship, a foundational essay, Scarlett also argues that a, um, a collective acceptance of partial citizenship also suppresses mass, uh, mass resistance against state-supported um, state actions. However, the women-led Occupy Pinnacle movement shows, shows us that it is Rastas in Jamaica, although comprised in the most marginalized of the black population, already have a history of cultural and political mobilization that threaten a particular kind of gendered, racial emancipatory project in Jamaica in the past and continues to threaten a certain, certain kind of modernization project today. Although Rastafari embraced the nomenclature of indigenous to express their marginality may require much further interrogation, it is possible to argue that it is precisely the displacement of indigeneity defined by Afrocentric thought and heritage and black women's cultural and political leadership in that movement that explains why these activists can mobilize locally as well as internationally. To conclude, in my research I have begun to, um, to outline an historical ethno ethnography of African descendant communities and their struggles for citizenship belonging throughout the Americas. Each geographic context illustrates that there are several historical antecedents to the contemporary land right, rights uh, struggle and gendered anti-racism mobilizations in general. These ethnographic insights illuminate how blacks in Brazil, Jamaica, and the United States have come to understand the importance of land over time, being propertyed versus property-less, and engaging in a theoretical debate about the relationship between land, be between housing, land, indigeneity, freedom, and national belonging. I would also add this relationship between blacks belonging to uh, or being in place in rural areas as well as being out of place and then um, how a, a struggle to belong in urban space. Carol Boyce Davies' um, book, Caribbean Spaces, Escapes from the Twilight Zone, is deeply influ influential in this comparative emphasis and this analysis is guided by her idea of recognizing the deliberate continuities in the Americas for imagining black liberation. Davies calls for an expansive notion of the underground railroad or escape routes in which Latin America and the Caribbean could also include um, the Mar Mar Maroon societies or as I mentioned earlier, Quilombas of Brazil and the Cimarrones and Palenques in other parts of Central and South Americas. Davies refers to, quote, a set of passages that, passages that pursue liberation in different directions, unquote. And, quote, movements of freedom not only toward the north, but also from the north to the south, therefore also from the Caribbean to the United States, and it's reverse from the United States to the Caribbean, and I would add from South America um, to North America. A hemispheric look at Brazil, Jamaica, and the United States pushes Davis' idea of escape routes further, indicating a migratory, indicating the migratory patterns of political ideals, such as the material claims of citizenship, including property or, um, ownership. Canadian geographer um, Catherine McKittrick suggests that today black diaspora subjects continue to demand and celebrate black, black land ownership as a politics of black refusal of a passive relationship with space, especially in spaces where blackness is disavowed or perceived as a problem and best kept out of sight. Specifically, my research reveals the historical dimension of how blacks have struggled to belong spatially, to occupy space, to be visible in the landscape, but as owners as of land. I want to end by emphasizing that there's a global pattern here where housing, um, and this is where my own personal interest comes into play, is a basic part of the human project. Where you live matters, such as living in poor, uh, a poor rural town or urban neighborhood, shapes your chance of, live, of having access to poor public education, poor um, health care, and, and something as basic as clean, lead-free drinking water, right? In poor neighborhoods in global cities, um, such as Los Angeles, Salvador da Bahia, and New York, harsh policing is oftentimes the first sign that gentrification and mass removal is well underway. When it comes to making the lives and experiences of black women visible, if we only wait to find, find them lying in pools of blood, 
cramped in overcrowded jails and prisons, we fail to see them where, th where they are struggling to survive. Policing and mass incarceration does not happen in a vacuum, and there are chain effects that, led, that lead to mass incarceration and to violent police encounters. What kinds of trauma are black women living with, having been beaten on sidewalks for grilling, shackled in hospital beds while giving birth, or lose their children because they have no place to live? Arizona State Professor Ursula Orr um, surviving being body slammed and being punished for resisting arrest was an act of resistance. Dajaria Betkan was also body slammed by the police at a pool party. Jasmine Headley at 20, age 23 fought with every fabric of her being to hold on to her baby when officers, officers ripped her uh, baby from her arms and she was later arrested and held on Rikers for five days. Jasmine was at the Human Rights Administration office to apply for food stamps. There had been a pattern of calling the police instead of practicing police res um, peaceful resolution. Over the past several months, I've been thinking a lot about Malaysia Goodman, who at 23, 22, year old, um, 22 years old, fell and died trying to carry her daughter down the stairs in a New York City subway. What kind of society do we live in where we spend money on policing poor people who can't afford to pay the subway fare that could be spent on providing safe public transportation, where landlords leave tenants without heat for years in an effort to push them out and the struggle against eviction start with demands for these kinds of basic infrastructural services that in can ensure um, basic human dignity. I want to end today pushing us to, to, to expand how we think about state violence, specifically how it impacts the lives of those living on the socioeconomic margins, whether it be in, in urban or rural areas, even as their neighborhood and communities have now become part of the coveted center. So for example, in Salvador, I'm also interested in how these rural areas have now become part, so you look at neighborhoods even like Kabula, they've now become part of the center of the city, right? That are all now in, in, um, increasing, um, experiencing gentrification. I'm trying to break down this urban-rural divide, right? To think about the highest concentration even of black poverty still being in the old um, plantation south. Colonization and settlement, whether it be in 1492 and 2019, does not occur without violence, primarily because black, indigenous, and poor people are always resisting being forced off their lands, out of their houses, off of their streets. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Perry, for that amazing talk. Um, my name is Pavitra Vasudevan. I'm faculty here at uh, the Department of Black Studies, African Diaspora Studies, and Women's and Gender Studies. I'm a geographer by training, though we do, it's true, very similar <laughs> work <laughs> in some ways, um, and I maybe should have been an anthropologist. Um, I am grateful to the Rapport Center for inviting me um, to respond to Dr. Perry. Her work models the inspirational and um, necessary scholarship I think we all ought to aspire to. Um, there's uh, a few ways that our work uh, parallels one another. I'm going to start there just to give you a sense of how I'm going to frame my comments. Um, I am a geographer within the subfield of feminist geopolitics um, or thinking as uh, Dr. Perry had mentioned about Kristen Smith's work, thinking about how state violence and structural racism operate as well through intimate relations. So thinking across scales of violence. Um, our methodology is critical ethnographic work. Um, so it's richly informed by how violence is lived and experienced and resisted. And then we kind of speak back or interrogate theories of structural violence by examining and thinking through the experiences of those who um, resist violence. So I'm going to speak to that as kind of black feminist praxis. Um, and third, uh, I think we both think through race and um, racism in transnational ways. Um, race is often examined and abstracted through these sort of localized forms, um, the ways that people experience racism, um, what Goldberg, uh, David Theo Goldberg has called regional racial formations. 
So each of these has their own kind of specific historical geographical context, which makes it really hard sometimes to um, think about theories of race, because um, in a sense, racism is always that which is experienced. Um, so thinking across these contexts raises difficult questions about um, how to do that work, as well as um, what theories uh, work and how they matter. And I think there's really valuable work that Dr. Perry's doing here that we can learn from. So I'll try to point out some of those. So I'll begin by just summarizing briefly the argument in this essay as I see it. And um, because this is a work in progress, hopefully that's a uh, kind of helpful reflection. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the three major contributions and questions I have um, based on those um, three aspects that I described earlier. So here, Dr. Perry frames violence, um, s begins by talking about this kind of violence that's targeted against, um, often described in terms of uh, uh, targeted against black males, uh, policing violence. Um, these kinds of targeted physical violence always work in tandem, as she describes, with the structural violence of dispossession, which often precedes um, and lays the groundwork for um, carcerality or state violence that we recognize in terms of policing. Um, so here, land is a central aspect and a component of ongoing struggles over racial capitalism. Um, and she sets up a framework where she's thinking through land theft, the taking of land, as well as the freedom struggles over land that demand land acquisition. So uh, people fighting for land, whether that's in terms of ownership or otherwise. Um, one of her contributions here is framing, uh, quote, land rights struggles as a crucial aspect of black feminist praxis throughout the Americas. Um, one of the arguments I think she's making that I uh, perhaps needs to be fleshed out more and could contribute greatly to understanding how racial capitalism works is thinking about how displacement or forced removal or migration, forced movement of people, is the link between anti-black racism and disposability. So what does that mean and how does that work? A corollary argument she makes here and throughout her work is that black women are protagonists who draw connections between structural racism and physical state violence. So here I think there's a really important genealogical contribution she's making um, to say, and it starts right thinking about, the essay starts with this um, around the protests, and particularly today when we think about the kind of mass, I think it was one and a half million people in the streets in Chile um, with what started as protests against um, transit fare increases. Um, and this is often uh, a way that large social movements have started throughout the Americas. Um, so here she's redressing this perception we have that these mass movements and protests, discontent, you could say, broad-based discontent with capitalism, is disconnected from the long durée of black struggle. Often these protests are visibilized as white, as middle class, or often as those who are increasingly precarious, but as she reminds us, this is a whitewashed understanding of capitalism, that it's not only a matter of uh, failed representational politics, but also the flip side of that is it's a failed <coughs> critical analysis because it decenters the centrality of race to capitalism and kind of negates our understanding of how this came to be in the first place. So who was precarious in the first place and how did this become more generalized is one way to kind of think about that, I think. So this is crucial work for multiple reasons. Um, for those of us who are students of black studies and feminist studies as well as kind of mainstream disciplines like anthropology and geography, some of the contributions I think were made explicit and some weren't, so I'll talk about a couple of those. Um, one intervention I think she makes is into feminist scholarship and black feminist scholarship in particular. Um, she's kind of very gently critical of some of the tendencies of feminist scholarship that ignores these material underpinnings, and I think that is something for us as feminist scholars to take seriously, both in Patricia Hill Collins' work as well in Dr. Perry's work. What are the actual material circumstances that black women face and why are these still a cause for concern, study, movement, organizing? Another sort of unstated intervention she makes is uh, examining these complex legacies of the afterlives of slavery. So this is within black studies an ongoing debate, a very contested topic. So here, for example, she focuses not only on racism as it plays out on um, the suffering of black bodies, but the complex ways that racism is tied to land, to place, and to questions of citizenship. And here, I think her works makes a mm -hmm. real intervention, even as it struggles with questions of violence and suffering, to not rely on anti-blackness as what some might call ontological, um, as sort of a fact of existence, but really tracing 
and here, this is a quote from her uh, essay, the genealogy of conflicts going back to the colonial period, as well as the emergence of social movements that inform the current fight against us usurpation of these women's lands and the demolition of their homes. So I think that's really important here. It's uh, always a fight, and I think Dr. Perry um, is doing amazing work to point out what some of those um, uh, sources of tension are, as well as the sources of violence, which are often in response to resistance. Okay, um, so to step back for a quick second, so the three aspects I wanted to emphasize, one was the kind of uh, thinking across scales of violence, the second was black feminist praxis, and the third um, is thinking race transnationally, or in this case, hemispherically. So in terms of uh, scales of violence, um, here, Dr. Perry is working on what we might think of as corporeal or bodily violence um, that is targeted by the state at particular bodies, um, alongside the spatial violence of dispossession, destruction of urban environments. These forms of violence have traditionally been understood as quite distinct from one another. So in my own work, for example, on racialized toxicity, which is about occupational environmental exposure to lethal toxins, um, I've talked about this distinction between policing as a kind of spectacular violence. It's a spectacle, it's visible, it's punctuated, it's event-based, um, and how that's differentiated often from slow violence of toxins that is ongoing, um, the danger of sort of living in everyday um, dangerous environments. Um, but as Dr. Perry reminds us, these are not only not distinct, but they are parallel processes that are often occurring in some of the same places, some of the same communities. So we would do well to try to think about how they work in tandem. Um, why does this matter? Sort of a big picture lesson I'm wrestling with that um, perhaps you are as well. Um, I often wonder what would abolition actually look like if we had to rethink how violence worked. If you can't just tear down the prison, what would abolition look like? If you have toxins layered in bodies and people living on permanently toxic sites, then what does abolition look like? Or in this case, if you have to rethink how dispossession works through these profound instabilities that are created by repeated dispossession of communities and people, what then would abolition look like? Um, so on that note, um, I think her work talks about and also embodies a kind of black feminist praxis um, that, as I said earlier, is inspired um, and gives us some real lessons into the kinds of work we all want to do. Um, I've been thinking about these questions a lot through uh, this geopolitical refusal that McKittrick says, um, right, in terms of this idea of domestic geopolitics. Um, I'm working on an article soon to be out. Um, so here I'm building on two understandings of the domestic. I'm going to kind of summarize that here just because I think it's um, a parallel argument. So I'm talking about the domestic in two ways. The domestic as a kind of inward facing uh, politics of empire. So this is picking up from the black power movement that often black communities within the Americas are internal colonies. Um, so I think we need, that's useful in a sense uh, to be more explicit about the kind of targeted nature of that violence, even when it looks intangible, such as hazardous environments, which don't seem to have the same kind of intentional uh, push behind it as policing. Um, as Dr. Perry conveys with such urgency, the kinds of violences that appear incidental or non-targeted, including gentrification, urban renewal, now there's uh, Austin, <laughs> greenwashing, <laughs> um, right, all these uh, high density housing, sustainable development, these are all forms of racial violence and it would do us well to remember these as uh, an imperial politics that the state is engaging in to draw those connections between the kind of external and the domestic. Um, I, I t call it domestic geopolitics for a second reason, which is to talk about, um, this is picking up the black geographies framework, which says that it's not just like forms of oppression that create black geographies, but it is the constant contestation of them, the constant resistance, the uh, spatial practices that emerge out of them, right? So domestic in the second sense refers to the social reproduction practices, the practice of maintaining life, maintaining homes, maintaining families and community in the face of this constant onslaught of viol violence. So how do communities who are the targets of state violence survive? And what can these practices teach us, those of us who desire abolition and, and end to the violence this world is steeped in, what can we learn from them um, about what, what is the world we actually want to create and what are the practices that are liberatory 
So here I think Dr. Perry persuasively argues that the answers to some of these questions emerge in and through the organizing of black women across the Americas. And this is a really ambitious project in some ways because I think it is, these are all very different contexts and the practices themselves are likely quite different. So understanding black women as protagonists is itself an intervention for mul multiple reasons. Um, there's of course, um, this is my plug for hashtag site black women. I'm actually not in the social media world at all, so I don't know how hashtags work, <laughs> but I just said it, so <laughs> hopefully it'll, you know, pass on, you know, hashtag, hash. <laughs> Um, but because of the intersectionality of race and gender in anti-black racism, black women are doubly burdened or triply um, by the capitalist systems of value that demarcate black people as not valuable and by the operations of patriarchy, which then shift the burden of responsibility for maintaining life onto them, right? So this is intersectionality, it's a uh, hashtag. <laughs> um, in the case of Dr. Perry's work, um, I think there's some really important work that's being done here around what have black women, both understanding how black women have uh, inherited and gained access to land, um, and there's strategies for that. I don't wanna say inherited exactly, because that sounds passive, but um, she gives us many examples of some of the very active ways. For example, purchasing land, purchasing the freedom of those who are enslaved. Um, there's a lovely example, I'm, I'm just gonna skim on the details, because I can't remember off the top of my head, but of, um, redistributing land to those uh, who settled into this area that was started by black feminists, for example. So all of these examples of how else can we relate to land, I think are a very valuable contribution and part of understanding what it means to see black women as protagonists in historical struggle. And I love this framing of um, drawing from Carol Boyce Davies of Escape Roots. And this is a quote from the essay indicating the migratory patterns of political ideals, such as the material cl claims of citizenship, including property ownership. So thinking about um, relationships to land as possible escape routes from this world, right? It's the basis for alternate possibilities. And that, I think, is an important genealogical and practical project to pay attention to how people have formed other societies. Um, and the third uh, aspect I wanted to talk about briefly is this kind of thinking about race and thinking about the Americas hemispherically or transnationally. So there's interesting work happening now, I think, about um, un disentangling blackness from the US, thinking blackness transatlantically. Um, and here we see an important example of that, of how to do that um, when we think about the Americas, North, South, and Caribbean. Um, for those of you who are interested in this work, I think Sylvia Winter is kind of promising figure to turn to, to understand these foundational events of racial violence that have created the modern world, and particularly the modern world of the Americas. Um, one question I had, and I think a challenge of doing this work sometimes, how do we understand here black urban dispossession alongside indigenous dispossession in white settler colonialism? So we, um, Dr. Perry had kind of hinted at that and thinking about how the Rasta embrace indigeneity as a source of political power or the claim to indigeneity um, in the context of Jamaica, but I think there's more work to be done there. And perhaps for all of us, especially in critical race and ethnic studies as well as indigenous studies, how do we think across these registers? Um, there's interesting work in geography that's coming out of the uh, young, I think, emergent faculty are doing. Um, Maggie Ramirez and Michelle Daigle might be interesting people to check out there who are talking about decolonization and abolition sort of hand in hand. Okay, um, I have lots of questions, but I'm just gonna leave it at that. And yeah, I'll leave it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, the last uh, question, especially, um, uh, and I can't wait to, to cite your your work as well um, in my in my essay and, and book. So, um, but the last question I think is really um, important, um, not just in terms of how the Rastas, um, as well as I mean, there are even other global cases of whether it be the Palestinians, et cetera, who have been mobilizing around indigeneity and what that means. Um, and what that means on, a, on an international um, scale in terms of um, demand and rights, I think is really important. Um, <clears throat> what I'm most interested in is um, 
precisely how black and indigenous dispossession um, happened simultaneously, I think is an important point to make. Um, Kelly, I was so glad that Kelly Lytle Hernandez's book, A City of Inmate, came out right at this moment when I was always struggling to answer that question because her book, A City of Inmates, really shows how the settler colonial project always had um, dispossession, displacement, and um, basically that it, the way the United States was always built is that the people would be completely disappeared, right? So I think her book focuses on Los Angeles and she, she looks at um, the disappearance, basically how a significant amount of Native Americans started to be incarcerated and disappeared and, and um, and how, and that's part of a much longer kind of genocide. So in addition to the massacres, how they actually started to be rounded up and put into prisons um, and banished in essence over time, tied to how even certain whites were also banished and incarcerated um, and how that process was accelerated. So what kinds of whites they wanted in the nation, this new, the new um, settler kind of society um, and also how that's tied to the banishment of Mexican Americans um, uh, as well, as well as African Americans who had migrated west, right? So I think that logic of that there always existed this um, particular logic about who belongs into belongs in the new set, so-called new settler society, and that all including Mexico uh, Mexican that. I mean, we all know that it was part of Mexico. This is lands were also part of Mexico. Um, that they all kind of started to be disappeared through the violence of policing and mass incarceration. Um, I think that for um, I think I really want to think more seriously about thinking through decolonization and abolition kind of simultaneously. And I think in my work on the United States, what I found is that, and you can say the same in terms of um, of Brazil is that blacks are not necessarily interested in the mass ownership of land in a way that involves a certain kind of logic of banishment and, and, this, and kind of elimination, um, as Kelly Lytle Hernandez, um, Hernandez would claim. I think they're really in, um, encouraged by a sense of, because most of the land African Americans owned were actually not productive in the sense that they, didn't, they couldn't generate capital. Um, that there was a sense of what it means to be in place after experiencing forced displacement, right? So what it meant for them to, um, to be able to belong spatially, spatially in these territories, right? So I think it's really, and to claim space. And you can see that playing out even in urban spaces, right? That you have folks being pushed off, even simple things like sidewalks. Um, to the point where even in, in Brazil, racial logics um, I've, I've had friends say, let's experiment. See who moves off the sidewalk first, right? And if you ever do that experiment, you'll realize that it's the black and brown people who move off the sidewalk and give space to whites coming down the road. So, um, so there's a particular logic around how we claim space and a refusal to just be pushed off and pushed away out of ur rural as well as um, urban spaces. But I don't think, um, I think some of the most critical communities, even including the new communities um, that came out of the civil rights movement um, were very, were also very, and, and you can see that in the case of Jamaica, were very um, co um, conscientious about what that means in terms of further um, indigenous um, um, exclusion and displacement. So I think, I don't think necessarily that blacks claiming a right to be in place, if it's not even just around the logics of property ownership. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to, uh, or has followed a logic of um, banishment of indigenous people, right? So I think that's really um, important. And I think even in the case of environmental struggles, um, you can see how um, blacks and indigenous communities have um, organized similarly. Um, so I'll, I'll end there and open it up for other questions and comments. But thank you so much, that was wonderful. There's so much for me um, to think about. But to the, the most important point that I want to un underscore, and not just in terms of the capitalist principles of property ownership, but the land theft is really about the banishment and the elimination that Ananya Roy and um, Hernandez, and uh, Kelly Lilo Hernandez are talking about, right? So that the land theft is about literally being forced to move once again, right? And you see that in Colombia, for example, 7.5 million people being forced to move um, um, off their territories, I think is really something for us to think about and how
that is probably one of the most sig in, uh, one of the most important black um, political issues, I think, of the day. When people are constantly, they're being forced to move um, for the transatlantic slave trade, and then they're forced to be in place um, in terms of plantation slavery, and then forced again to move for rapid capitalist development, whether it be in rural areas around palm plantations or um, gold mining or um, um, renewal of cities. <laughs> no pressure. You get a name. Sorry, go ahead. Come back. I'm like, you get a name. You get a name. Sorry, go ahead. That's an important um, question. I'm not familiar with that essay, and I'll definitely look it up. And but I think it's not an unfamiliar argument. Um, partly, what I would respond and say is that um, much of these political activists, especially Black political activists in Jamaica, and I would say in the United States and in Brazil, of course, because even the production and the construction of quilombo um, for and, and and a lot of <laughs> I think in the early years, many people asked me, you know, do the communities that you studied would they identify as being Colombo? Um, and perhaps in the historical, in the colonial period, they may have been Colombos, right? Um, and even the, and the present day processes of becoming, as Jan French kind of talks about, kind of using the law to become Colombo um, um, is, is a, it's a uh, political formation process. And it's something that has to be recreated in some ways, right? And it's not to suggest that not, there aren't actual descendants of, of runaway um, formerly enslaved communities, um, but a lot of black communities today, in order to claim land rights, re, um, basically reclaim uh, the term through a kind of a becoming a kind of a process of explaining and demonstrating that they fit these historical canons, right? Even if, you know, there's no real memory in the community of, of, of that. So um, that said, I would say that in the case of Jamaica, for example, people are very conscientious of what um, settler colonialism did to the indigenous communities of Jamaica, right? Um, and it's always, even in um, the textbooks 
Um, I would say that there's always um, a, kind of a constant memory of the violence and the elimination of, of um, indigenous communities. I think, for me, I, I keep bringing up Shelley um, Lido Hernandez's book. I think reading how settler colonialism impacts all of these communities simultaneously, I think is really important. Um, but understand that it's the violence of colonialism that produces even the identity of indigeneity, right? So the indigenous is something that one has become in the process of um, colonialism that even the adherence to time and a certain kind of, kind of original occupation of the land is something that comes out of that violence. Mm -hmm. For example, we know this in Newport, Columbia, this happens in Newport, Columbia, right? So, um, and Africans can't even be Americans but for Columbus. It's in it's it's in, in the post-colonial moment that even terms that even how we understand blackness um, in this is, is in fact starts to um, emerge. I think the, the thing about Jamaican um, is that like Brazil, well, generally I'm not sure if that's the case now, but maybe more people are coming here. But I would say that always. I mean, I still have I would still hear people say that there's no racism in Jamaica. It's a class it's a class problem, right? There are black people with money, right, in Jamaica. I think what looking at the mass scales of some of the poorest neighborhoods, and I mean that's where Deb Collins' work comes in as really important, and her she has a film on Black on Rastafari as well, is that they represented a certain kind of blackness that was unwilling to conform to Europeanization, right? One because in in the urban areas they realized there was no space for poor Jamaicans, right, in these communities, whether it was Kimberly Gardens and others. And that they saw that if, if there was an opportunity to go back to Africa, and it meant that we had to go to Pinnacle for some decades, grow some marijuana, build up capital, they will also have their own schools, follow a completely different logic um, outside of Europe. Um, so that that they were willing to do that and then go back to someplace else, right? So I think partly they represented a certain kind of blackness that was a threat to the European social order that was maintained even after um, independence. In fact, and I don't go into this here, in fact, their, their willingness to admit, basically, um, independence was traded for the burning down of Jamaica. The, the, the agreement was that you had to, the government of Jamaica had to get rid of Pinnacle and Rastafari if they were going to get independent, right? Um, and that's why even for decades you would see, even to this day in Jamaica, you will see there's a light skin elite that run the island. The Jamaican intellectuals, political elites, until recently, I think it's only Portia and the previous um, prime minister who were, I mean, of all time, of all, almost you know however many years, that were black Jamaican, right? And still seen even to this day as kind of holding economic and political and and social, intellectual, and political power on the island. So I think, but Rastafari is not just about their dark skin blackness; it was about this idea that they wanted to maintain some sort of Africanness. In, their, in an understanding of themselves that was a particular threat. And any sort of independent country had to move in the direction that you were basically independent, but you were still a colony. You were still a so-called part of the Commonwealth as we, as we are today. So I, I think to re-signify indig indigeneity in that context is not about the displacement and the dispossession of indigenous folks. It's about, in essence, recognizing the collective process uh, is basically how that collective violence of colonialism impacts a group of people that crosses these so-called racial lines, right? So like I said, Kelly Lyle Hernandez, she looks at even how the problem with, with poor rights is that they start to latch on so much to the material rewards of whiteness to not to see how the logic also impacted them, right? And there was also a missed opportunity for them to also mobilize both poor white West Virginia indigenous folks, et cetera. So I'm not, um, I think, Sometimes I worry about the reparations dis debate, and I think that the folks who are talking about the original, I forgot the term, is the original descendants of, of slavery, yeah. Um, that, I mean, in terms of this idea, because I've had students who, you know, talk a lot about, um, you know, what does it mean to be, you know, of this place, you know, and I would say that, you know, <laughs> I mean, you, I mean, what do you mean you're of this place, right? <laughs> like, so I think, there are sometimes those discourses end up reproducing and displacing um, uh, Native Americans, but I do say, I would say though, that there is 
uh, sense that, um, at least in my work, I'm conscientious of this, that it really is about recognizing mm. how even claims to territory um, are collective claims to territory, but it's also not about the ownership of the territory, per se. It's about self-determination, which is what I think black and indigenous people all want. Right? It's about the ability to really be able to decide your own futures. And I think Du Bois's 40 Acres is in a Mule, he all, I mean, his argument is that had African Americans been truly given 40 Acres and a Mule, and in that sense it was actual fertile land to cultivate, we, we, I mean, what would African Americans look like today? So that missed opportunity to really democratize resources, um, I think is important. And, and I think I don't go into it here um, in this presentation, but it's um, in the longer paper, is in the same way that when, when um, Europeans were recruited to the Americas, they were actually given <laughs> as part of the, the settler colonial project of who were the ideal people to settle, actual land to, to actually fully realize you know, who they can become in the society. Right? And part of it is not just about profit, it's about the ability to live and survive. What happens um, when you keep pushing and pushing and pushing Native Americans away from fertile ground? And you see the results today. So part of it was the actual massacre from guns, but also the massacre that takes place when people are pushed away, away from the lands that are most fertile, that allows them to eat, um, um, and oftentimes towards more toxic ground um, that slowly killed them. Um, or So I think there's, I think I would probably argue for us to think about these processes of taking place simultaneously, not the displacement, the replacement of one over the other. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll try to keep my answers brief. Um, there's this book that I just came across um, about um, things about Colombia, but they're Colombia, Venezuela, but it's the old, um, the older names for these territories, um, and it's called Demanda Mi Libertad. And what I like about that book is about African, um, Afro Colombians, Afro Venezuelan women, who um, they use legal documents um, to look at how, how what kinds of um, claims they were making. Oftentimes, uh, mostly t um, claims around their freedom, right? So they believed that they had been freed, and someone was trying to re-enslave um, re them, and um, you know they enter these lawsuits um, to claim their freedom. And a, a significant part of that freedom is always around also uh, making. Um, you know, I was entitled to the land of the, you know, whoever freed me or what was entitled to me. And, and so, so I think that's a really um, important part of that. So there are ways, I think partly what the overall project does is to look to see how black, um, uh, black people have used the law despite how fraught it may be in terms of who created those laws and understanding why those laws were created. Oftentimes laws were created to really regulate or as you know, Michael Hanscher talked about basically kind of regulate discrimination in Western democracies, right? So discrimination, um, so basically, basically it's a way to, um, uh, to mitigate discrimination inher in, inherent in um, Western democracies. So I would say that I'm interested um, in looking at that at, um, in the Brazilian case uh, specifically. Um, I would say that oftentimes they've had to challenge the law around what, for example, what kinds of rights should black people have, for example, when they don't fit neatly within the constructions of, let's say, quilombos that are oftentimes rendered only as, as urban, I'm sorry, only as rural areas, right? Um, what happens to land claims in areas and territories that have now become urbanized and cities and become cities, right? So I think, but then making claims to say, look, they'll still use, um, for example, the claims around the use of the, the soil um, that if you've been living on the land and using the soil for a significant period of time that you can make 
claims to the land. They're not interested in land ownership per se, in terms of land rights as collective, and oftentimes in terms of not individual ownership, but as collective ownership, but just the right to stay, right? They don't want to be evicted, right? So it's not about land ownership so they can resell their land. It's about land ownership so that they don't have to move from uh, the coast, for example. Or in the case of Donna Thelma, that she, her house is not going to be dem demolished to build a high rise. Right. Um, I think partly um, I'm interested in kind of ideas, the movement of ideas, one where they don't always start in North America. And partly what I'm always suggesting is that it's my research on Brazil that allowed me to think differently about my work in the United States. Um, so for example, what I've, you know, my work in Brazil never had any sort of intention to, for example, document Police abuse, partly it was, it was activists like um, uh, neighborhood activists who said that police violence and the everyday actions of the police was a part of the overall project of um, displacing black folks, right? So the everyday presence of the police and beating residents and incarcerating residents um, and killing folks it was actually part of the, is a similar part of the project of disappearance, banishment, elimination, um, you know, however you, whatever term you may use, right? So they're acting, they're, they're being carried out, carried out simultaneously. And even the terror and the fear, it's not unlike the terror and the fear of having someone burn across on your lawn and then, you know, moving as a result or flight. Or even after abolition, one of the first things that African Americans were interested in is complete flight, right? They were gone. Um, and I think, so I think something to, so I think I'm interested in the sense of escape routes, um, but you've also seen escape routes where African Americans are thinking about moving elsewhere, right? Either to Africa or to other parts of the Americas in search of something else. So, so I, I start off the longer essay with the boys, um, you know, and the, the problematic name of colonization syndicate of African Americans really wanting to go to Brazil because they were interested in to see what, what could, is possible elsewhere. Ryan Man Ham Hamilton looks at um, African Americans going to what was then um, Haiti is now um, part, Samana, part of the Dominican Republic, right? So there are ways they're thinking about how these escape routes that are off, not only from the north, south going north, but that they're always going all over the place in, in the diaspora. So I think that's something to, so it's actual kind of in terms of how we think about and we read our experiences, so interpretive frames um, and knowledges, but also actual movement of African diasporic folks. So I think that's something um, for us to think about and what that looks like over time, because I think sometimes we oftentimes think about these migratory processes as being recent, right? And I think, I think um, um, when we look at, for example, Jessica Cruz's book on the Kisama, she traces um, the movement of um, the Kisama from Angola to Colombia and Brazil and how that informed um, maroon thought and practices, right? And um, actual kind of spaces of refuge, right? So I think that's really important. What's nice about looking at the new communities model or kind of collectives um, to use, actually Ted Gordon's um, sister, um, Jessica Nemhard Gordon wrote a, a wonderful book on co um, black cooperatives in the United States is that slowly over, that, that black cooperative is oftentimes represented as, well, first of all, cooperatives are represented oftentimes as something that white people do, right? And she, has, she does a long history of the kinds of cooperatives that African Americans have organized as a way to actually practice 
a new understanding of freedom, right? Outside of the capitalist logic. Um, so I think the Rastafari community is one example. They were one, trying to figure out how to move, go all the way back to Africa and the, accumula the accumulation of capital is really about really you know, leasing a ship or something to, to move everyone back to West Africa. Um, but it was also about in the time they were settled at Pinnacle, for example, it was about new ways of thinking, um, new ways of engaging each other in terms of men and women and children. Um, they had their own schools, they grew their own food that was organic. Um, and so there's a way of practicing a new way of, of living in this capitalist society that it's, it's a material logic. So I think even a lot of cr critics of Rastafari today say that they've moved away from that preoccupation with the material kind of the materiality of black freedom or black liberation, right? Where it oftentimes requires that you move and you move away from these spaces of oppression, right? And you have to build new communities. And some of it seems kind of lofty, but Jessica Nemhard Gordon argues that little by little you see folks kind of practicing, you know, growing their own food, um, you know, buying pieces, of, you, know, you know, going to live on farms, New, uh, new kind of cooperatives kind of emerging, right? And that was, it was a, a way of the past for African Americans to kind of see how they can materialize freedom, but it's also becoming a way of the present and people thinking about what are the ways that I can actually um, create new ways of, of our, this a new, make the world anew somehow outside of these logics that we're familiar with. So I would say that's it. I think in terms of the idea of moving away from citizenship, I think, um, um, uh, Michael Hancher's book, um, The Spectre of Race, is useful here. He talks about how, um, basically, he looks at the relationship between um, racism, anti-black racism, and Western democracies, right? And that even how we understand, and this is something you're familiar with, how we understand citizenship is oftentimes, often shaped by a logic of who belongs and who does not belong to the nation, the, to the polity, right? And, and even the, um, democracy itself is, fl is fraught um, primarily because um, it's always mitigating discrimination in some sort of way, right? So it's not that everyone belongs in, in, the, in a democracy, um, is that only certain people belong in terms of accessing the resources in terms of rights and um, uh, in that, in that um, nation state, right? So I think perhaps moving towards what a lot of the scholars on borders have been doing in terms of thinking concretely about what it means to have open borders, what it means to have people move in um, across borders as well as, I don't, I don't know, but I would say even, I mean, and many scholars have theorized, and that might be something worth teasing out more in this particular essay, have theorized the problems of citizenship um, and the disjunctive nature and what it means for class, race, gender, sexualized, so forth. They overstand, yes. <laughs> and down pressure. <laughs> Um, 
God child. I'm like, son of God. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'll start with the um, the first question and I'll work on my way down. Uh, thank you so much for all of these questions. Um, I'm so glad for the opportunity to be here, of course. Um, I always tell people that um, I spend so much time with a nine-year-old that adult conversation is always <laughs> welcomed. Um, <laughs> like, don't do this, don't do that. Well, um, so, yeah, so having to form entire sentences is, is, is helpful. Um, <laughs> So the search for black citizenship and um, I think is really interesting because, um, and also this idea that, and Saidiya Hartman in Scenes of Subjection talks about this, that folks, you know, one of the first um, kind of mission was people to move as far away from the plantation as possible, right? Um, so it's not to suggest, you know, Whitney Battle and others and Maria Franklin, others have d done a lot of work around the communities around plantations um, black communities around plantations, um, but certainly this flight away from the kind of the symbol of black um, um, black oppression um, and black enslavement, I think was really important. So this sense of flight towards something else, I think is really important. Sadia Hartman's new book on wayward lives, um, uh, wayward lives, beautiful experiments, is really about black just willingness to try something else, right? It's about uh, moving to the city of unknown. People have been sending messages about that there are possibilities, but part of it is just saying, look, I wanna go something else away from my, the proximity, the spatial, you know, the spatial proximity to what was plantation slavery, right? So people were willing kind of to leave everything behind and move um, to the city, 
in wayward and wayward lives, what she does beautifully is um, to argue that they tried to break down all of um, what was um, in essence constructed for them. So in Scenes of Subjection, she says that people are trying to put them back into these kind of heteropatriarchal kind of categories of family that, um, you know, supposedly that had been broken down under slavery, right? Um, these heteropatriarchal families. And, you know, women had to perform domestic duty and so forth. What she, dis uh, what she discusses in Weary Lives is that women and girls are like, forget it. I'm gonna do whatever I want. I'm gonna experiment however I want. I'm gonna have sex with whoever I want. I don't wanna be married. I have children, this one and that one. And Du Bois, at the same time, is documenting this and says, oh my God, look at these. The reason why African American communities are not thriving is because they're pathological, they're engaging in promis they're pr um, promiscuous, um, et cetera. And that becomes a real foundational discourse in um, why blacks are not, not because of the structural forces um, in terms of dilapidated housing, et cetera, that, and the, uh, the racism entrenched in terms of employment opportunities, et cetera, but that they are um, lagging behind because of their social behaviors um, and that we need that 10% acting right, and, and to use um, the term loosely, to improve African Americans. So I think something to be said about the search for citizenship, I would understand Saidiya Hartman saying is like, look, I, we want to create something else beyond what we, you know, I can, I don't have to marry or have sex with whoever the plantation owner wanted me to have sex with. I don't have to maintain. So for example, she talks about, you know, families, you know, women who decided not to marry after having some bad experiences, right? Um, so I think that's important. In the in the Jamaica in the Jamaican context, citizenship was really a break with state the state completely, right? So um, you have I mean the fact that they were able to quickly recruit so many families to move from the center of the city to rural lands with so-called nothing. Um, and one there's a sense that you 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 have access to something. You're gonna be able to eat. You're gonna be able to you know there's gonna be subsistence farming, et cetera. You're gonna be able to thrive. Um, but for example, Rastafari family refused to marry to this day. There's no legal, they're not, they don't marry within the law, primarily because you know, marriage itself as an institution is, 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 it only makes sense within a capitalist structure. It's really about the, the, the division of resources, right? And, and the securing of resources. Not to say love is not involved, I'm sure, sure it is. Um, <laughs> it, it surely is. But it's about regulating resources. Even the same, the same, the right to marry movement is really about the, the ability to have um, to really have resources distributed, you know, in terms of how spouses um, um, access resources, right? The fact that in this country, for example, um, access to property is um, is really um, you have greater ac access to property and property rights and value if you are married. I mean, really speaks to the capitalist nature of marriage as an institution. So I think, um, so for example, so that's one example of how Rastafari, for example, completely re refused to exist within that that logic. Um, Many have been criticized, especially the men, of saying, well, women have to go do domestic work, earn money, when, for example, the lands, even to this day, where the lands are not, so outside of the pinnacle experience, when the land, when people aren't making enough money in the rural area, black women are still engaged in, for example, white households, while the men can philosophize. So there's been critiqued of what that looks like, right? But in a sense, there's always this, this preoccupation with, we have to do something other than this post-colonial society, because it, it's actually a neo-colonial society, right? So I think that's important. So redefining citizenship that's, you know, that, that, that embodies black power in a way, um, I think that's outside of the way the Jamaican state understands itself, right? And I think even the metaphysical dimension of Rastafari that one could argue is tied to how the um, religious religions of the African diaspora work is the sense that you embody um, the divine, which is, you know, so everything is about you embodying the divine, not that the divine is elsewhere, I think is important, the same way that Afro-Brazilian religions, for example, work, right? So you become the divine, right? Not that there's some European divine out there in the world that one imagines you are God, right? So I think that's something to think about how that already challenges a certain kind of logic um, in, the, in the Americas. Um, I'm not sure if I have an, a good answer for you, um, and I would also just kind of add one more thing about black citizenship is that the idea around mass migration is that a lot of folks were, were f um, fleeing white terror. <laughs> Let's just be clear, right? They were f fleeing lynching, <laughs> you know, on a mass scale, um, crosses being burnt, the everyday terror of living in, I mean, the, the, the fear 
of surviving because th there was, with freedom came backlash, right? Um, that there was blacks were gonna gain power, black were gonna demand rights. So understand that the mass migration is part of, so for when they talk about, um, when the warps of our sons talk about um, um, kind of this black citizenship, it's really about the just not surviving in the context of the plantation South, right? And this real fear, right? I think that's something to think about. In terms of um, Brazil, in terms of um, Quilombo rights, um, I don't know if I have an adequate answer for what other models exist, um, but I do think that more and more communities have been trying to kind of trouble what it means to claim land rights under those um, um, legal statutes and what happens to black communities when they don't neatly fit under those definitions oftentimes set by anthropologists who have to go in and say, well, perform a ritual dance to show us how you are a Quilombo and not often not and or indigenous communities because um, it's so called maybe easier in instance to say so for indigenous communities claiming quilombo in order to to not be wards of the state but have territorial rights I think are kind of problematic the foster care thing what I was arguing is that I think you're right I mean that was a perfect example of how it becomes part of a much larger system Dorothy Roberts work I think is really great about um, for thinking about um, how foster care becomes part of a, a bigger um, problem of state violence, right? So uh, my mother's a lawyer, and I mentioned to some of the students earlier, but people lose their kids for having roaches in their house. You know, people lose their kids for not having running water. People, I mean, I'm talking about their water got shut off, their light got shut off. People lose their kids because they, uh, all the, the, all the, the, the um, and this is something that middle class families can do, which is, you know, parents and their kids sleeping in the same bed, right? Um, which I just got, I was just forced to the couch recently. I just, I, I can't do it. I can't live <laughs> like this. I wanna, and actually at one point I'm now sleeping on the bunk bed because you know, like he sleeps in the king bed and I s sleep on the couch or on the bunk bed. But, um, but yeah, so for example, my mom has had cases where she says you have to get separate beds to get your kids back, right? So. Um, so basically, poverty in this country that we know is racialized and gendered poverty, because we know all of the layered statistics that you're pointing to around um, earning the 50 cents on a dollar <laughs> um, or less, um, being under, not just unemployed, but what it means to be underemployed. So there are a lot of working people out there who cannot afford good housing, right? Especially in gentrifying spaces. Um, that the quality of the housing then becomes a way of determining whether or not you are a good parent. So for example, people, you know, for example, these, the violent checkups on your house to see whether or not your house is decent enough to have your children. And, you know, Dorothy Roberts does a wonderful job of documenting this, but how then even middle class white families, um, as well as same sex households become complicit in the disappearance in essence of black children from black, fa from black communities, right? So how, then, for example, in the cases that my mother sees where they go to middle class, upper middle class families, the houses are nice and wonderful and shiny, and the children fall in love with the summer camp and the housekeeper and all these things, and then they are like, wait a second, I want to go back to that poverty, right? Or there becomes this brutal legal fight where a judge says, why would you take a child out of those conditions and send them back to, um, to that? to that, right? Or the real reality, which is something that my mom is seeing increasingly, of the opioid addiction affecting poor whites in their majority in the state of New Jersey, for example, who are also losing their children, where um, there's really the, no sense of any sort of uh, rehabilitation that one can actually rehabilitate oneself and in time make claims to it. By the time you become rehabilitated, your child is already gone, right? Or, or the other story she told me of a man who she fought to get his child back, but he had to drive all the way from, from Texas, um, ironically, and I think he's eight hours into the trip and the car breaks down. He has to drive back, so she's call he's calling her to say, I can't make it, and she's saying, please, I'll buy some more time because the, your kid is gonna be adopted um, into the foster care system. Right? And even in the logics of the foster care system, 
They'll rather pay a family $1,000, $2,000 a month to take care of your child instead of giving you the $2,000 to take care of your child, right? And if your child has special needs, that is an additional amount of money. So there's also financial. So not to suggest that people aren't doing a fantastic job of, of taking care of children through foster care as well as adopting children, what I'm suggesting is that there is a real dark dimension to foster care and what it means for, in essence, and this is a long history. Sabia, Sabina Vaught talks about this. I mean, the long history of the disappearance of Native American children. I mean, it's just a long, I mean, one could keep going. It's a long history. And Sabina Vaught's book about children being disappeared into juvenile detention and then being also disappeared through foster care, I mean, all deeply tied. I mean, it, it's a very, what I'm suggesting is that if you're only are waiting for people to be in a pool of blood, you don't see the other ways what does it mean? When you lose your child to foster care, what does it mean? What the kind of trauma that that black woman must be, must be, must be experiencing, right? So I think, um, and the child as well. And it's not to suggest that people don't need support. What I'm suggesting is that oftentimes the real cause of the violence that led to the loss of a child or even if someone even, um, the trauma that, for example, leads one to engage in drug, drug abuse is oftentimes not addressed. It seems as just blank, final, pathological, done. And, and much, it's a part of a much larger, I think, logic of disappearance um, and elimination that we probably need to think more seriously about. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I, if I can, I'd like to, actually. We can talk after. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So we have a room for about a half hour or so. Yeah. Um, it's incredible. People haven't made it. Obviously, <laughs> Me too. Great. I'm looking forward <laughs> to be on that tour. <laughs> and, um, yeah. No, thank you so much. much. And and I, I would also like to say thank you so much again um, to you, Karen, and Eddie, and, and Sarah for organizing everything. Um, first of all, the hotel on campus is beautiful. So glad they built that. Um, um, but also just uh, the opportunity to kind of stop and think about this work that is really near and dear to my heart. I think it is wonderful. So thank you so much for all your questions and comments. Thank you.